So welcome everybody to yet another episode of Shadows Podcast. I'm your host, Trip Odenheimer. I've got a full house here today. I got two co-hosts and we got an amazing guest with us. But before we get started, I wanted to let everybody know if you haven't already done so, head over to our Facebook page at The Shadows Podcast. Go ahead and give us a like over there. And then over to Instagram at the underscore shadows underscore podcast. Uh, follow us over there. We have some bonus content. We have like a weekly read that we're coming out with that we're, we're starting to push out to people. Uh, and just we're going to have some clips as well. So definitely head over, check us out, follow us over there um, for, for up to date guest information as well. But today I'm super excited because we have Natalie Higby here with us. Um, super, super pumped to get into uh, her journey and everything that she's been going through. She is a personal trainer, a breathwork master. She is co-founder of Durable Athlete, which we'll spend some time talking about. And she's also involved in Junior NBA. So, and she has a lot more accolades and stuff uh, to read off, but we'll get into to some of that a little bit later on. But before we get started, Batista, how's everything in Vegas? Things in Vegas are really well. Um, just out here chilling. I uh, started working out at 4 a.m. in the morning, so I'm excited to see. How's that going? It's it's just going. I don't even care. I just I just get up and do it. So I have a gym in my garage, so I just get it in, and it's been good. So, I, 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 what's that? I was gonna say, how long have you been doing that? Is this day two? Uh, 5 a.m. I've been doing uh, a long time. <laughs> A long time. 4 a.m. is a different beast. Yeah, uh, 4 a.m. is definitely different. So you ramped it up to 4 a.m. 4 a.m. has probably been happening for two months now. So that's a habit uh, now. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah. I've, I've been doing the same thing. I get up at four, but the weather here, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of weak. I get up and I, I go out in my garage in this Montgomery, Alabama cold. Uh, I can't do it that that 35 40 degrees in the morning i'm like no i'm gonna hold my workout off till eight o'clock nine o'clock um so i'm really bad but i have a really good workout at eight or nine so i guess that it balances out um speaking of pearson this is your first episode how's your uh garage gym coming my garage gym <laughs> over i need a decent size gar- yo my garage at this apartment is like they took a closet and was like hey Let's, let's see if we can fit a car in here. So I don't have a garage gym, but I do get up at like five and I do my, I do fasted cardio in the morning. Uh, I got, you know, I go to the, to the gym right around the corner. I could walk to it if I want to. But Y'all got one I, at your I, complex, I'm, right? Yeah. Well, the one in the complex isn't open, but one right outside of there at Anytime Fitness right outside the complex. I use that. And, you know, it's 24 hours a day. So I go twice a day. Okay, so we've established we're early risers here. We'll go ahead and welcome our guest, um, Natalie Higby. Thank you for joining us today. What what uh what time do you get up to work out? Well, I usually get up anywhere from these days, like I'd say five forty five to six ish. Um, there's been times when I've gotten up earlier, and I really honestly prefer to work out in the morning, but I have a lot of clients that I see in the morning. So like Mm -hmm. I have some clients that I see at 630. um, And then I have other classes that start at seven. And so I try to just get up and do my thing for a little bit in the morning before I start working. And then I've been working out in the afternoon around like two, two 30 these days. Uh, But if I had it my way, I would just like have my morning to myself and be able to do my workout first and then kind of go about my, my day. So I've had to make some adjustments just based on everything and trying to make the most of it. But um, I do like to wake up and go to Barton Springs, which is a pool here in Austin, Texas. Um, the pool stays about 68 degrees year round. Ooh. And so people always think I'm crazy when I post pictures of going when it's like 30 degrees out. But in reality, the water is the same to me whenever you're getting in, you know, no matter what time of the year, it's just how cold is it when you get out uh, is the real question. Um, so sometimes I guess you could call that a morning workout. I go early, uh, you know, when the sun is coming up or before sunrise, I like to get in for like a 10, 15 minute swim. It's like a cup of coffee for me. Like if I don't have my coffee, if I don't have my workout, my whole day just doesn't seem to, to go really right. Well, man, we're going to get started before we, we dive into to all the amazing things you're doing. We have some rapid fire questions for you. Uh, Pearson's actually going to throw two of them at you. So I'm going to let him get started with his first one. 
Okay. Boom, rapid fire. Here we go. Uh, what is your go-to book? Go-to book. Ooh, like when I like go always go back to like reread. Yeah. Okay. Um, to be honest, I really love Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. By Brene Brown. Okay. What do you love so much about it? It just talks about being vulnerable and being open and like reaching towards your best self and how sometimes when you share your struggles with others, they can then feel like uh, the inspiration from that, right? And it's this contagious thing of like, if we were all just a little more open about what we're going through, the world would probably be a better place. And we would um, realize that like, we don't have to be perfect in order to reach our best self. So I, I like her whole message. Yeah, daring greatly. I love that. I'm writing it down. I'm going to add it to my uh, library. Second we'll, have the, question. we'll have the link for that one as well. Yeah. Boom. My second question, what's your guilty pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> y'all are gonna make fun of me we don't no. do that on here no okay well i don't know if you guys listen to spotify at all but i would say my guilty pleasure is i love justin bieber and so today popped up like your most played of the year and literally out of the top five songs four were his and he was my top artist and i kind of laughed to myself i was like i'm not I, i'm not ashamed of it i guess but it's a guilty pleasure I enjoy, I enjoy his music. We don't judge on here. Batista is a T Swift guy. There yeah, no. I'm a believer as well. So no, I, I hear you loud and clear. Don't be ashamed of that. Uh, here's your second question. It's a two part question. Okay. Usually they ask you if you could have any superhero power, what would it be and why? But every super, superhero has a weakness as well. So what would be your superhero power, but what would also be your weakness. Man, I, superhero power, my mind right now is going towards the ability to travel anywhere. Um, I guess you call it time travel too, that'd be nice. So the ability to go anywhere, to go back in time and um, like be with people maybe who have already passed or to be with my family or to be, you know, in one place across the world and come back home the next day. That would be a great uh, super power to have. And then a weakness. What is mine? Like, what would I consider my weakness? As, a, as that superhero. Oh, as a superhero. Um, Travel know. restrictions. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> This time of the year, I mean, maybe that's why my mind is going to traveling because this time of, I mean, you know, 2020, we, I haven't been able to go anywhere or see my family. And so, yeah, maybe if all of a sudden I couldn't go anywhere, then I would lose that ability. So we just Open. need to slap a couple of travel bands on you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So my question for you is you have a day off. You have absolutely nothing going on. It's nasty weather outside. You get this, you get some of this Montgomery weather. What is the one movie series that you would binge watch movie series so i'll share something about myself i tend to fall asleep when it comes to movies although well maybe it's the stockings behind you i would just say like christmas movies in general right now would be something i would want to watch like hallmark not even hallmark like just a christmas story elf for christmases um what did I watch Jingle All the Way the other day with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Okay. So let me rephrase my question. Yes. Go to Christmas movie. I would say a Christmas story. It's just one my family and I have watched every year. Yeah. Uh, but there's other ones on there that I find maybe more entertaining, but I, that one's like, I don't know, just one that I watch every single year. All right. I have, I have an impromptu. It's, mm -hmm. it's Christmas related. Home Alone 1 or Home Alone 2? Oh. Home Alone 1. I okay. love, I love Home Alone 1. That's a great one. We'll keep recording. Okay. So that was, <laughs> that was a good answer. So uh, thank you for those. And now we'll, uh, we'll get started with your upbringing. So just tell us a little bit about your childhood, your parents, where you were brought up. Yeah. So I grew up in Dallas, Texas, um, like North Dallas Richardson area, if anybody's familiar with that. And you know, I think it's really cool um, 
that my parents are still in the same house I grew up in. They've been in that house for over 30 years. And so I love the fact that when I go back home, you know, I still have the house that I grew up in and like the neighborhood I grew up in. And there's actually quite a few families that I grew up with that are still in the neighborhood. And so the neighborhood I grew up in, which I think has really shaped me, um, I'll explain a little bit. So there's just like a, let's say like a rectangle park, right? The park had, it was like a tennis court, a soccer field, a pool, a little playground area, like a half basketball court in an open field. It wasn't anything like fancy, but it was just like, uh, you know, it had a park in the middle and then all the streets around it were these U-shaped streets. Uh, and so it was kind of a private park. And what I think is so cool when I think back to that area is all the kids that I grew up with, there was quite a few kids at the time. There were like a couple girls that were just a year older than me. And then a few boys that were like a little older than my brother. I have an older brother. So it was a span of like maybe even 10 years between everybody, but we were all really close. And it just allowed for us to like be at the pool all day, go play at the park, go to this person's house and kind of bounce between everyone's house in this somewhat safe environment. Um, and we would set up like tents outside at the park. We would all go camping. Um, and these families, you know, they were our friends, but they are somewhat my, like our family, you know? So when we have Christmas parties or reunions, it's all of them that are invited um, that we're really close to. And something that's special to me and my family is my parents are still together, not necessarily, uh, that doesn't mean that things are always easy, you know, but they're still together. And what's crazy is a lot of these families that I grew up with, when I think about those families as well, the parents are all still together too. And I feel like there was just some, that there's something about having that community and people to lean on and kind of like help raise your kids with you and whatnot. And like, just enjoy time with that kind of kept everyone together. And so, yeah, grew up in Dallas, grew up in a really cool little neighborhood park area that my parents are still in. I am the youngest of two. So I have a brother who's about three and a half years older than me. I grew up a huge tomboy. So if my brother wore it, I was wearing it. If he did it, I was doing it. Like I wanted to basically be him. I just like loved him so much and looked up to him. And the cool part was that he was always open to me playing with him and, and him like being the protective older brother. Um, and so we've always been really, really close. Uh, with that said, I was definitely into a lot of sports. So again, having that neighborhood was very conducive to like playing hockey outside, you know, just playing whatever it was that we wanted to do, uh, building lots of forts. I absolutely loved being outside and just like climbing trees, all the above. So nature's a big part of my upbringing as well. Um, and if y'all want me to be like specific about something, please let me know. Um, my dad is from upstate New York and my mom is like a true Texan. So that's also a fun dynamic in our family of like uh, the difference between their kind of upbringings and how they raised us. But my dad grew up in upstate New York, like in the Buffalo area. And we had a family lake house in the, and we still do to this day, a family lake house in the Adirondacks. Uh, in, it's like technically off uh, Racket Lake. And so that was basically where my family would vacation every single year though. It was like my grandparents lived there for half the year. Um, and so that was where we would go every summer. That was our one big trip. And so there's also people that I've grown up with like in that area uh, that be I became really close to. And I would say that shaped me a lot as well because we would spend anywhere from like one to three weeks at the lake. And it's definitely like really secluded. You know, we didn't have TV, it's very campy. And so there's a lot of like fishing and just camping outside, making a fire, stuff like that, that uh, I feel like shaped me a lot as well. Um, so yeah, that's a big part. And then do I keep going? Oh, no, I was going to say you, uh, you kind of hit me in the feels talking about your, your upbringing, about playing with everybody in the neighborhood, the, the tight knit. And um, it, it's something that I feel like now is kind of lost. I feel like now it's, it's something that, you know, I, I went to my neighbor's house yesterday because our water was out and I was like, oh, this is their living room. I've lived here for a year and a half. Um, but just that, that, camaraderie in the neighborhood and, and even for kids going out playing outside look I used to come in when it was dark and now my kids go out to the mailbox and they're like you know the sun oh my gosh um it's, it's crazy I I agree with you because it would be I mean my mom would blow a whistle when it was dinner time it was one of those things and like if you heard the whistle you came running back and yeah we'd be out there late and you know, sometimes we'd be rebellious and like take our bikes outside of the park and go to the Creek, like in the other neighborhood when we weren't supposed to, but like, 
yeah, we just loved being outside and adventurous. And I actually just bought a house. I haven't moved yet. We're closing on it um, with, with my boyfriend, but with the mindset of, you know, my parents have been in their house for 30 years. That's what I was going into this house thinking, like, I don't want to plan on moving in five years. Like I want this to be like a forever home. And it's just weird because that's how I was house hunting. It was like, where would my kids play? Where's the park? Like, where's the space to run and play around? And so that was a big piece of looking for house too. It was like, I know I maybe can't match that type of community that I grew up in. And it'll always like be special to me in, in that way. But I want something similar to that. So that, I don't know, hopefully, yeah. you know, they can get outside. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that sounds good. So congrats, by the way, on the house. Thank you. It's very exciting. So tell us about um, high school. Like what, what sports did you play in high school? What was like your go-to? What do you think was the, the one that you were uh, most drawn to? Yeah. So sports wise, as far as just junior high, I played everything. So it was kind of like when it was track season, soccer, whatever it was, I was doing it. Um, in high school, I ended up sticking with volleyball and basketball. And a couple of reasons. One, soccer was really like my true love growing up. Um, I ended up getting really into basketball and volleyball in like fifth, sixth grade, I guess. Um, but my like our high school team just wasn't that great at soccer. And honestly, if you were really serious about soccer, you were paying select, which was just very expensive. And uh, my family at the time, we just couldn't do that. Uh, so I stuck with volleyball and basketball and super happy with those two. I absolutely loved my coaches and my teams and I really enjoyed playing both sports. Um, yeah. And what I grew your... up in like a five day school too. So it was a pretty big school district. Wow. What, what, what was your uh, position of basketball? So basketball, I'm like five ten, And so I was actually more of a post player, more of like a forward. And then I ended up playing a year of basketball at the university of Texas at Dallas, which is a D three school. And I kind of moved more. I played a little bit of post still, but more of a shooting guard as well. So kind of like transitioned out. I wish I would have trained from the very beginning as if I was a point guard. And then I probably could have gone farther, farther, but, um, being five ten at the time, I think there was only like one or two other girls that were taller than me on my high school team. And so that's where I ended up. Um, with a, with a really big passion for blocking shots. My favorite thing was defense and my favorite thing was blocking shots though. So were you a trash talker after you, you got a nice block? No, I'm, I'm like very competitive, but also so nice, you know? So I, I don't know if I ever like would say anything, but um, I did get an award on our team for being like tough as nails. So I'm competitive and I'll, you know, I'll definitely like, I can hold my own having grown up playing with my brother and a bunch of other guys, but I can't trash talk. I can't, I can't do it. You're, you're, I'm a Cardinals fan. You're like a Larry Fitzgerald type. I like that. Yeah. yeah just I, throw, throw the ball back to the official. Don't even talk. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about university of Texas at Dallas. You, you played basketball your first year there. Uh, what career goals did you have? So I, from, I remember as second grade, I decided I wanted to be a teacher and to me, there's just something I was already very drawn to helping others. And, um, I always had a love for kids. So, you know, I started babysitting from a young age. I just loved kids as, as I would be wearing all of my brother's clothes and I'd be this tomboy playing sports. And then I would go play with my dolls and just like want babies. I don't know. Like I just, I had this soft spot spot in my heart. And so I always knew I wanted to teach. And I honestly thought I would teach and coach. And I thought I would kind of get into like a junior high or high school setting coach at a school and be a volleyball or basketball um, or teach at the school and then coach one of those sports. And I ended up getting into early childhood education is really the route that I went. And again, still thought that I would coach. And um, what happened was I only played a year at UTD because being from that area, because it was about 15 minutes from my like hometown, I guess, like or my high school. Um, and so even though I lived on campus, I just wanted more of a feel of actually leaving home because I knew with Dallas being such a big and great city, I would probably get a job teaching somewhere around that area, um, just knowing the people that I knew, and then I would never leave Dallas. And so there was something in my mind at the end of my freshman year that was just like, I got to get out of here and I don't know where I'm going to go, but I'm just going to go to Austin where my best friend is and she needs one more roommate anyway. Um, and so I actually like really last minute moved to Austin and went to Austin community college. And then after a year of that, 
Um, there's a school, Texas State, which is about 30 minutes south of Austin in San Marcos that I had quite a few friends there. And I just honestly liked the uh, smaller college town feel of, of that place, um, having visited that quite a bit. And so that's where I finished my schooling was in San Marcos. And so that's kind of why I stopped playing basketball was just that transition time. And, you know, I played for fun. Uh, did all the intramural stuff and absolutely loved it. But at the end of my college career, when I was going into student teaching, so if y'all don't know, when you're in school for education, your whole last semester is basically one big unpaid internship of working at a school. And some of my friends who I had been working out with owned like a CrossFit gym. And they were like, hey, rather than going back home to do your student teaching, why don't you do it here? And why don't you start coaching for us in the evenings? And I was like, oh, this is great. I've always wanted to teach and coach. And so maybe this is how I kind of do that. I'll teach at the elementary school and I'll coach at this gym rather than a sport. And so that's essentially what happened. I got like CrossFit Kids certified. I did all these different certifications um, so that I could begin coaching. And then once I graduated, coaching was going so well for me at the time and I was enjoying it so much that I actually just did coaching full time, but I did run like CrossFit kids classes. So I still had that interaction with like youth athletes and kids that I loved. I was able to build out like a women's program, uh, which I loved help promoting like strength and confidence in women. Um, and then just working with other clientele. And so that's how I actually got into the whole personal training fitness world and career. So before you got into that, you, uh, you taught third grade for, how was that? Yes. So I taught third grade. It actually, so what happened was, is I personal trained for like three, four years out of college. And then if, it, if anybody knows much about personal training, it's maybe a little different these days because there is so much online. Um, but you know, it's just, you're working all day long and you're trading your time for hours and you know, there are no health benefits or any kind of perks. And um, so after doing that for three or four years, I, I just felt like maybe I should be teaching and then trying to run like summer camps for um, kids and see if maybe that brought a little more security for me. And just like, I was just really stressed out driving back and forth right. to work and like worrying about money and all sorts of stuff. And so I ended up um, subbing at a school and then getting a full-time, um, or a long-term subbing position and then a full-time teaching job that next year. So I have like a break in my personal training career where I was personal training. And then I taught third grade for three years. And then I've been personal training again for like two and a half years. Um, so we can talk about that transition, but the funny part about teaching third grade is that it's not that different from what I do on a daily basis when I'm teaching group classes of adults, you know, and, Ultimately, I'm just trying to make people realize their full potential. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to challenge every single person in the room, you know, regardless of if it's their first day or they're like a little bit behind or it's someone who's really advanced and they need a little bit more. Like there's that fine line as a teacher where you're like, I have to teach one lesson to all these people and I need to make them all feel challenged and successful at the same time. Right. And then you have to kind of like assess each one and then you have to scale up or scale down. And it's just like this continuous process. And so for me, that was great. And I really enjoyed it. It's all the other back end state testing stuff. And um, I don't know, there's just so much in teaching, like hats off to teachers. I know this year would be a crazy year to be doing all of that as well. Um, but there's just a lot more in it where I was like, I want to just I still like was trying to incorporate breath work with my kids and movement with my kids and teach them about, um, you know, growth mindset. And for me, I'm like, maybe I just, I like getting deep with adults and I like health and fitness so much that that's kind of what drew me back out of it. Um, and looking for more work in the health and fitness world again, but I genuinely really enjoyed teaching third grade as hard as it was. Yeah. All three of us are instructors right now. We're all teaching virtually via teams or zoom or, or one of those platforms and it is a challenge it is it definitely has its uh has its advantages but it has its disadvantages as well um so just to let you know a little background so pearson has some personal training experience i have personal training experience experience as well i think i personal trained from like 2000 to 2006 mm -hmm. um so i i totally agree with what you're saying your schedule's just so spread out throughout the day and it's not like a set schedule um, but that was really interesting what you said about uh, third grade being the same as teaching like a group fitness. You're having to challenge everybody um, as much. So uh, did, I, did I read correctly? You were in the CrossFit games? Not the games. Where, 
where did you hear that? Yeah. Because take me to the CrossFit Games. No. Yeah, in- um, internet. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, no, I was very into CrossFit. I coached yeah. CrossFit and um, I'm trying to think. I mean, yeah, you, you know, you do the open and you compete, but I never made it like to the the games games. Um, I also did a lot of strongman training for a little while, which was super cool. Um, but no, that would have been really great if I made it to the CrossFit games. So let me, let me ask you this. And then I'm sure Pearson's got some, some training questions for you. Um, which do you prefer body weight training or actual grabbing your hands and throwing some weights around? Tough question for me. Um, and I'll tell you why I see, I see a lot of benefit in both. And I want to encourage people to do both because I think a lot of the times it's one or the other, right? People either get very into the body weight training, um, or vice versa. But I think there's so much to be done with just body weight. And I think that most people would benefit greatly from learning how to control their body weight first and learning how to maximize their strength with their body weight first before they ever pick up a weight. And that's something that I wish I would have learned at an even, even younger age of just like how to actually move, how to run, how to jump, how to be mobile and be strong in different ranges. Um, and then there's just something very empowering about picking up something really heavy and like I don't know, picking up a weight, in, you know, in your hand, um, or even I'm thinking like being on a pull-up bar. I know it's still a bodyweight exercise, but like something about grabbing onto the iron of the gym, um, is great. But I think at this point in my life, maybe I'm talking myself into bodyweight training, although that's not what I necessarily do on a daily basis, but I think there's so much value there that, um, hasn't even been really tapped into by a lot of people. Yeah. I've always, I heard someone say a while back that, you know, going and lifting with some weights is like a personal challenge and the weights usually win. They'll kick your butt and it gets you coming back the next day. Um, but I I think especially with COVID, everything that's happened, when we initially uh, kicked off, we started ordering home gym stuff and it was all on back order. I was kind of having to resort to a lot of body training. And I think a lot of our listeners have probably had to do the same thing uh, when gym shutting down. Um, but you can be surprised what you can get out of that and it can whip your butt just as much as those weights well that's what got me really into bodyweight training is i'm someone who loves learning and i love a challenge and i first found like real bodyweight training i'm not just talking about like high knees butt kicks and sprints and jumping jacks like that's all fine but like just moves i had never even done before and i'd done yoga it's not like i hadn't done yoga but these are just different types of movements right um a lot of what i teach now And I remember thinking like, I've been an athlete my whole life. I've trained my whole life. I've done CrossFit, which covers a lot of different modalities. I've done strongman training. I've done yoga. And yet these body weight exercises that I'm doing for the first time were the hardest thing I'd ever done. And I was like, why can't I control my body through this range of motion? Or why am I so tight in this range of motion? And yet like I can go back squat or deadlift or whatever. And like, I still can't really control my body weight that well. Right. Like they just, they just felt so challenging to me. So that was what like sucked me in instead of turned me away was the fact that I was not good at it. (laughs) I was like, Ooh, I need to do more of this. Like let's get better. It's crazy watching your Instagram videos too. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm never going to record myself doing half of those stretches and and stuff that you do. Cause I'm like, Oh, that looks, let me try that. It's humiliating. I need to get better at it though. So it's, it's definitely a challenge. You start somewhere. I, when I tell you that I was the kid that I couldn't touch my toes growing up, like even in high school, you know, we're stretching before a basketball game or volleyball game. And they, all my friends would laugh at me and be like, now they touch your toes. I'm like, I can't, like I couldn't do it. And so that's what I'm saying is when I did some of these movements, I was like, Oh, like my hips are really tight or like my wrist kind of hurts or my knee is bugging me. And now here I am you know, almost four or five years later of really practicing these movements. And I'll have certain people say they look easy, which they're still not easy for me, but um, it just comes with practice and time, you know? Yeah. I think I heard you on an interview. You were talking about like uh, finger movements and toes. And you you were talking about how like one of the the things that um, it's just like all in our brain, you're talking about like circling your toes. You can circle each individual toe. I, I have, and it is hard. It is, and it, but it should be super easy. Um, so I just, I think it's really interesting. I think your Instagram uh, stuff has some, some pretty interesting 
uh, challenges on there. I encourage everybody to go look at it and then let us know how, how that went for you. Batista, you got something? Yeah. Uh, well, we forgot to mention a few things with me. Uh, I actually taught girls gymnastics for a long time, uh, for three-year-olds to 18 years old, actually. And not only girls, but boys as well. So I taught boys gymnastics. I've been a break dancer for a very long time. So I understand body movement very well. And one thing that helped me a lot was martial arts. And then I started weightlifting uh, when it's because we're all in the military, right? When you go on a deployment, they're just right there. And you're like, all right, I'm going to weightlift. So what my question to you is, um, what got you into body movement? And then where do you go to, where do you research body movement? Who do you go to? Are there coaches you look at? Or is it just random stuff on YouTube? Where do you go? Great question. And I'm glad you brought up martial arts. I also did martial arts during college. Um, and I wish at some point I will pick it back up. I hope I do because I was two years into getting my black belt. So I was only a year away of getting my black belt in Taekwondo. Um, so hopefully I get back into it. So, and that's a lot of, um, body weight training technically. Right. And like we did other sorts of, uh, like boxing and martial arts classes that they had, but, um, I got into body weight training, like the style that I do now through on it. So there's a gym in Austin, Texas, the on it gym and on it is actually truly a supplement company. And, but it, it, it started with the idea of like human optimization. And with that came different modalities of training that were maybe like more optimal. Um, and maybe like things that we had been doing as humans for a long, long time. And so they were very well known, like when kettlebells kind of came out, there was like the kettlebell training, they do steel clubs, steel maces. And then basically there's just a couple of my like mentors at the time, there was a guy named Isik um, that was teaching a class at on it that was great at body weight training. And then the two guys that are head of education at on it would be Shane Hines and John Wolf. And they brought in their past knowledge, which I don't exactly know, you know, where they learned everything, but they brought what they had learned over time into on it and kind of developed like the on it education system, um, which is rooted in like a durability system, which is that joint by joint, like checking in with each joint on a daily basis, taking care of our tendons, muscles, joints, all the above. And then they, and then there's like a foundations course, which is just again, kind of like basic human movement. And then they have all of their tools. So then you go into barbell, um, kettlebells, steel clubs, steel maces. Um, so on it was really where a lot of that inspiration came from and knowledge came from. And I will say probably the biggest source other than them is Mike Fitch with animal flow. If you guys are familiar with animal flow at all, at all, uh, a lot of the movements are either from animal flow or again, it's not even necessary that Mike Fitch made up all these movements. It's like movements that humans have kind of done over time, but with a different intention behind them maybe. Um, and then kind of like incorporating them into workouts and it was just stuff. Yeah. That I had never done different types of rotations, different positioning for my body, uh, that just felt really, really challenging and really good. And as hard as it is, it felt like things actually start to open up a little bit more over time. So that's why I just have continued to adopt them and seek out people who train that way or seek out other people who have a different perspective on it. Um, and just continue to implement it in my life on a daily basis and, and set aside time to explore for myself is something that I try to do quite a bit. So Pearson has a question on standby and I, I have to ask this one though. Can you talk about the benefits that you get with body movement that you won't get with lifting or what do you, what's the difference when it comes to the benefits of body movement exercises? Yeah, there's a few. So I'm going to start with just the first one that's coming to my mind, which is getting like building body awareness, I feel like is, is truly one of the biggest things. Right. And so a lot of times when you are picking up an outside object, your focus is on moving that object as best as you can. Whereas when you are doing body weight style training, the goal is to manipulate your body and be strong through these different ranges of motions 
just with your body. And so it builds that like mind body connection that you'll hear people talk about um, and just brings more awareness to the areas that feel restricted. And so that's where I think a lot of people are like, oh yeah, my shoulder hurts and my hips are tight or my low back. And it's like, once you really get into a lot of this body weight training, you'll realize real quick what movements are hard for you and what areas are tight because you're in these positions now that you maybe haven't been in before. And then you're able to address those positions and hopefully help them, you know, function better essentially, but also then gain strength. And I think a lot of people think that body weight training, um, it might be easy, but I think of it, um, my partner and I always say like strength isn't about how much weight you can lift. Strength is about the, the ability for you to control something through a specific range of motion. And so if you can slow down your movement and add rotation and turn and twist and do all these things and do it slowly and do it uh, controlled, then you're also building strength through those ranges that might need that as well to kind of help mitigate injury in the future. Or if you do get injured, hopefully help you bounce back faster. Um, so just to become like a more resilient individual. Does that help? That was actually a great question, um, Batista. That was, I mean, that was also what was on my mind. And I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm listening to the podcast or as, as we're talking and, and well, as you guys are conversing and I almost forget that I'm co-hosting because I'm so, I'm so like in this, uh, in this and everything that you're saying, I'm finding so much similarity to, I guess, your um, physical training theory, right? Uh, and philosophy compared to mine and Bodenheimer's and, and Batista, um, especially with uh, what you were talking about with the mind and body connection and uh, the awareness that you have with your body. You know, I started off with just just body, um, just body training, uh, just moving my own body. And uh, I, I find that through that, knowing that um, my body becomes my trainer, right? I know what part of my body I need to work in the gym when I'm going to go lift weights. But another thing that I noticed um, in, a, in an article that I read uh, about you is your four pillars, uh, movement, um, breath, sleep, and nutrition. And I think a lot of people don't, don't you know, whenever they think about physical fitness and stuff, a lot of people think about the movement and the nutrition, right? How much weight do I need to move and what do I need to eat? Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about breath uh, and breath control? I know you do a large piece on, on breath control, but I think that's um, such a, a key part to fitness. Definitely. So the way we typically talk about breath in our four pillars is, um, the ability for it to shift our state. It's like the easiest way that we can upregulate our system and downregulate our system. And the durable athlete and what you were referring to, like our four pillars of the durable athlete uh, is truly built around helping people feel, move and perform their best. And we focus a lot on recovery techniques in order to perform our best, because we often see people that are you know, just not recovering well enough. They're not sleeping enough. They're not getting enough food based on their training. And in this case, there's so much stress in their life and they don't quite know how to like ease themselves from that stress. And so if we can just learn simple breathing techniques, bringing more awareness to our breath, understanding that if we just can pause for a second and slow down our breath and become aware in that moment, like uh, we can often change our state, right? And so we're you'll see a lot of people these days, we're living in this um, sympathetic state, right? And like, there's stressors from work, there's stressors from life and the world, everything that's going on. And then working out, which is a good stressor, and there are other good stressors, but it's just another stress that we're putting our body under. Um, and so I would say that you know, we use breath most often just to down regulate people, although you can also use it to up regulate depending on like the cadence of your breathing. Um, but for us, it's more about like, you know, people talk about meditation and mindfulness. And I think we just refer to that as breath, because for us, when we're doing breath work, that is being in the present moment. And um, yeah, just like, letting go of whatever else is in our mind and those anxieties. And, um, and then using that to help us when we train as well. So the more you kind of bring awareness to your breath, whether it's just when you're sitting before you go to bed, whatever, like it becomes a habit 
uh, of everything you do, right? So then just becoming more aware of your breathing as you're moving um, and realizing again that it has an impact on your performance. And sometimes there's times when we need to slow down our breath and there's times where we maybe need to speed it up or we can play with even like just doing nasal breathing that day and trying to focus on keeping a pace um, of just nasal breathing and hopefully trying to increase that. Or it's like just paying attention to the fact that like you can only mouth breathe in that moment, right? And what does that say about your intensity of that workout? And is that even optimal for the workout that you're doing that day, right? And so I'm going to, yeah, I'm just going down the rabbit hole of breath, but um, I would just say that we usually use it to downregulate people, but there's all these other instances where we like to just bring more awareness to someone's breath and and have different breath work uh, strategies for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I, I like how you uh, mentioned uh, the intensity. Uh, we actually, I, I run a, a postpartum program um, for to get, you know, mothers uh, fit or military mothers back into shape for their PT tests and stuff. But we, we, we run on a scale of um, it, uh, the rate of exertion. Have you seen that chart, um, the rate of exertion? And it's pretty much focused on breath control. Um, mm -hmm. If you can carry on a conversation while you're moving, moving uh, determines uh, uh, that intensity level. But uh, thank you for that. I think that's such a, a big thing. I think, um, sorry, Bodenheimer uh, has something for you. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, like rewinding real quick, uh, tell us about Durable Athlete. Yeah, uh, Durable Athlete is a company that my boyfriend and I have created. And it, again, is based on those pillars. And it, it came from us wanting to share what we believe is a, like a holistic approach to health and wellness with the world, right? And so, so often... Uh, you see people who are like, well, I want to look and feel my best, right? So I'm just going to work out. And then on the flip side, we have all these fad diets, crash diets, all this confusion about nutrition. Um, and then on top of that, though, people aren't even realizing that they're just in this stress state and they're not even getting enough sleep to support the things that they are wanting. And so we're just both, I would call us just like nerds. Like we love learning and it's just our way to be able to like, we know that all these things are beneficial. Um, and so how can we teach others about these things that truly make it like, it's all interconnected. Everything is connected. Right. And so it's tough to have someone working on their fitness goals. If they're not taking into consideration the stress that's in their life and the nutrition and the food that they're putting in their body, and then just how many hours they're sleeping in order to recover, right? So it's like things that were coming up in our daily conversations. We just decided like, these are our pillars of health because this is what we need to see from people. Like we have certain things we chat about with them in order for them to be their best self, right? And that kind of brings me to the, the second part of my question is, you know, I, I read the book, Why We Sleep. Um, yeah. Very good read by uh, Matthew Walker. Um, and I think out of your four, I think your four pillars are phenomenal. I think that they're simple. It's just something I think that, that people uh, oftentimes tend to overlook two of them. And Pearson and I were talking about that before we started with this, with breath and, and sleep. But explain the importance of not just eating right, not just working out and lifting right uh, and having proper movement, but sleep. Well, I will tell you guys that when y'all were telling me that you wake up and work out at 4 a.m., my first question was, how much sleep are you getting? Because, again, having a pillar of sleep, I tend to really, like, get my clients to understand that I don't want them working out unless they've had at least seven and a half hours of sleep. And granted, everyone's in a different situation, and, you know, people um, can kind of, like, survive on less sleep and feel fine and whatnot, but I would argue that like, you're not actually at your optimal state, right? It's kind of like if someone, I'll just use this example because it's coming to mind, but if someone drinks a lot and they're kind of used to being hung over, you don't know what it feels like to, to not feel that way until you stop. And then all of a sudden you're like, man, I don't really want to wake up feeling that way tomorrow because I feel so good right now. And so I think sometimes we get stuck in these cycles of like, we're just not sleeping enough and People don't know how much better they can feel, how much that affects their energy levels, how much that affects their cravings and just like their hunger, how much that affects what their output could be on their workout. And then if we're trying to build muscle and fix our hormones, because a lot of people, you know, 
have that going on as well is like, we want to build muscle and we want what's best for our hormone health. Uh, sleep is the ultimate reset button for that. Sleep is when all of that happens. Right. And so if we're just go, go, go all the time and we're not resetting, then we're going to hit a plateau or we're going to burn out or we're going to get sick. Something's going to kind of hold us back. Or again, I would argue you're not actually at your optimal self. Right. So it's like, yeah, you can keep pushing, but like, do you really feel that great? Or like, do you really have that much energy? Um, we probably could be at a better place if we were more mindful of getting higher quality sleep. Yeah, it, it definitely helps you, uh, you know, it, it, in terms of health, uh, thinking more clear, being more productive throughout your days. I'm so glad you didn't ask us how much we got, because um, that would have just derailed our this whole podcast right from the get go. Um, Go ahead, Pearson. I have one on sleep real quick. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and pass that. Yeah. Uh, so to answer your question, last night I got three and a half hours of sleep. Uh, I'm kind of used to it because I've been fired for 12 years. So I, I totally understand what you're saying when it comes to optimal sleep, right? Or do I? I don't know. I'm the one who worked out at 4 a.m. with three and a half hours of sleep. So my question is, I do wake up and then I go, man, am I going to work out right now? Or... Am I like, like the motivational YouTube videos tell me to like get up and do it or should I be sleeping? And then my next question to you, there's a lot of people uh, who have struggle with getting their workouts in. So what is the minimal uh, require? What do you think is the minimal amount of time people should be working out? Well, so, I, you know, again, I get that we live in a society where like a lot of times our life is determined by our work schedule and what we kind of do on a daily basis, but I would just challenge people to try to take their health into their own hands and just try the best they can with what they have. Right. And so I would obviously figure out with people what the best options are and what we can do. But if someone's like, Hey, I really don't have any time in my day to work out, then I might even have them not really work out, but just try to get 10,000 plus steps every day and focus on proper nutrition, right? So it's like, let's not add one more thing to stress about. Let's not put our body under another stressor of working out, but let's just kind of what I would call like eat less, work out less, like just have a really a diet that works well for that lifestyle, get enough movement in, in the day and at least go for some walks, um, and get some sleep. You know, obviously I know that there's also this whole, like, um, you know, endorphins start flowing when we work out. And there is that mental aspect to like being our best self and working out and pushing through things that are hard. Um, and if that's the case, and I would just say that like, Hey, sometimes even 20 to 30 minutes is also more than enough if you're doing that on a daily basis. So could we find other ways to work out in your day where maybe you're not taking an hour or an hour and a half to work out and we're just working out for 20 minutes, getting the most bang for our buck. And then we've got the rest of our day to get everything else done. Right. And then again, it comes back to sometimes people think they need to work out because they're trying to burn off all the food they ate. And it's like, maybe we just need to make sure that we're eating mindfully and that we're limiting our stress in our life. And then that way, like that 20 to 30 minutes is still good for cardiovascular health. We can still try to work on some strength work, but like, we're not using the workout as a way to burn calories. You know what I mean? Like, that's not really what it should be meant for anyway. Um, and so again, it's, it's definitely like context dependent, depending on the person, um, what's going to work best for them. But I would highly encourage people to just like think about why they're working out at that time. And if there's any other option and where else could they fit it in? Could they just maybe, you know, move a little bit more, be a little bit more mindful about their diet. And then therefore maybe not feel like they have to be so intense and get a longer workout in. And if that's not the case, then I'd be happy to work with them and chat about what else we could do. But I hope that helps a little bit of what I would just recommend for my clients specifically. That's awesome. That was a great question, uh, Batista, and an uh, awesome, um, awesome explanation. Uh, and since we're just on the topic, you know, we talked about breathing, we talked about um, sleep. Uh, you know, obviously, I think what everybody wants to know is what are you eating and what do I need to eat, right? Um, but a lot of people also want to know, not only um, am I eating enough, what is, you know, do I need to track my macros and stuff, but a lot of people, I know in my, with my clients and stuff, they always ask about supplements, right, and I just want, right, okay, <laughs> uh, and I'm sure Bodhi and, uh, and, and Batista can, can um, attest to the same, um, what is your take on um, supplements and supplementation, 
and uh, and then I have another question for you after that. But uh, go ahead. Okay, my whole philosophy and what we have built the durable athlete around is daily lifestyle habits that are sustainable for as long as someone lives, right? And I think we live in this world again where we're looking for quick fixes and not that su supplements are quick fixes. I take supplements, so I'll get into that. But I think that so often people aren't mastering just the foundations of health. So again, if we go back to drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, getting enough steps in in the day, hey, are you eating enough vegetables and enough protein? Like, are you eating mostly real foods? Or are we eating everything from packaged? Are we getting fast food? Like, there's a lot of people that jump straight to, hey, what supplement should I be taking? Rather than focusing on all these other things that are free typically. And you know what I mean? Like they're not going to cost them money to buy. Um, it just takes the consistency and the dedication, which I've realized over time is actually very difficult for people, right? Like that's the struggle is people just can't seem to stick to it. And so they're looking for these, again, these other options of like, well, if I don't want to do that, what do I need to take? And as far as supplements go, I would say that like, based on what I know, most people, uh, I would recommend, you know, consulting with a doctor, getting some lab work done and having someone look at it. But most people can benefit, especially in the winter months from vitamin D. It, you know, a lot of times they, we aren't getting outside enough, aren't getting enough sunshine. Um, so vitamin D is usually a big one. And magnesium is a big one. Um, I like to recommend like zinc and iron and like sometimes just like ashwagandha, like mushrooms for people if they can find a supplement with some of that in it. Um, yeah, and then I take collagen is what I take as far as like, you know, a protein. I don't really take like a protein shake, I guess, but that, I, I guess I, I take collagen on a daily basis. Um, but to keep it simple, I think most people could probably benefit from vitamin D and magnesium, just based on what I've seen and know. Um, but again, that's gonna be, you know, person to person, to person context dependent. Um, but I would just challenge people to see like what they can they do before they start spending money on supplements to just improve the quality of their life and their health. I've resorted to coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love how you pointed that out too about um, and the fact that it's it's the the lesser expensive route, right? Um, a lot of people want to go that that quick route and. What, what can I do? Because I don't really want to change up the convenience of my diet, but how, how can I supplement it to offset it? And I always tell them, you can't out-train a bad diet, period. So you just kind of need to lock it in, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I did notice, like, you know, we've been doing some research on you, as I guess, you know, any any host should, you know. Um, I noticed a lot of uh, uh, dairy-free and um, vegan-type uh, uh um, meals and recipes and that you have, are you vegan or do you push that way? Or, or what is your, um, take on, uh, uh I guess meat-based proteins and stuff. Is good there a question. protein you will stay away from? No, I actually got a big old box of, a like a butcher box today full of meat, which is great. Um, I, there was a while where I was vegan, eating like more vegan ish, I guess. Um, I would just say like, when I think of a plant-based diet, plant-based eating to me, that just means that we're making sure that we're eating enough vegetables and like each meal is plant-based and then adding to that. So I'm not opposed to eating meat. Uh, I eat fish. I eat meat. I pretty much eat everything. I don't, I'm not a big dairy person just because for a while I tried cutting it out and I felt like it just helped with my skin and like just gut how I was feeling. Um, I recently actually took a food sensitivity test, which I hadn't done prior to cutting out dairy. Um, and one of my top things came back that I was like somewhat sensitive to or allergic to is actually eggs, which I think is a common one for a lot of people. Um, and dairy was actually kind of lower on the list, but it's just something that I prefer not to eat based on how I feel like it makes my literally my gut to my skin, like look and feel. Um, so I try to find other alternatives or just cut it out completely. And so, yeah, I'm not opposed to eating really anything. I just personally have like preferences as to what I eat and what I like and what I feel best with. So I got, I got kind of a two-part question for you. 
So you've talked about uh, working at on it and you've talked about what you're working with, with durable athlete. How did COVID throw kind of a wrench in your life and your plans like it has for most people? And then uh, how did you get connected with junior NBA? Good question. So COVID actually, in a lot of ways, aside from the the obvious negative side effects and not seeing my family like business wise has been great for durable athlete and for my partner and I. And so here's what happened. The gym closed down on like March. I forget the day, but beginning of March uh, on it shut down the next day, Christian, my partner walks in the garage as I'm working out and he's like, Hey, we just got a call from the junior NBA. Like we've got a three month contract with them and they're paying us well, and it's going to be really awesome. So let's talk about it. And I was like, wow, literally one door closes, another door opens. And so we got the basically job with them through a connect. Her name is Banya, and she was working for the junior NBA and happened to be in the States. I forget what she was doing in the States, but she then had the option after her work uh, related trip to go to like Miami or come to Austin to train with us. Miami would have been like more fun. Austin was literally, Hey, I want to go meet the durable athlete. She, she just found us on Instagram and was interested in what we were doing, which was super cool, right? That the internet can bring you people like that. And so, um, yeah, she had a session, a one-on-one with Christian. She came to actually a class I was teaching at the time at on, it was a durability class. And then like a 9am group fitness class, uh, cause my schedule was super full. So I could only see her if she came to those classes And then the next day she trained with Christian again uh, for a a one-on-one. And so we just created a really good relationship with her. She was super nice. And she was kind of the one who put us in contact with the people in the junior NBA when they were looking for um, someone to kind of help them in their situation, because Christian and I both had experience with putting out content on a daily basis, um, doing a lot of body weight training. And then both of us you know, played basketball. We're both big basketball fans. Christian works with NBA guys and youth athletes, mainly basketball. That's like his dream world clientele. Right. Um, and so it was kind of, and then I taught third grade. And so there were all these other like pieces that came together for, Hey, we're actually looking for someone to be able to do at home workouts, body weight and basketball, 30 minutes a day, film them at home, which if you've never tried to film on camera and work out, it's one thing to be a good like fitness person. It's another thing to actually be able to coach over the internet. And so I think that was another thing they were like looking for people who, you know, weren't afraid to be on camera or had that experience. Um, and then we both had played basketball and then included in that we did breath work. We did mindfulness practices. We would do like gratitude journals with the kids and some reflection times, um, which was familiar to me and what I would do when I was in a classroom with my students. And so it kind of brought like everything we loved and we were good at together And yeah, we got to do that for like two months straight. And then um, as things started to open back up, we've now done like today, literally I'm still wearing my clothes. (laughs) I did a workout with um, like some junior, the junior NBA, it's called her time to play. So it's like all women um, and and youth athletes, like ladies. Um, And I did an online zoom workout. So now we do some of that. That's awesome. Um, So a couple of questions kind of sticking with the, the whole COVID theme, I guess you could say, of where we're at. With everything that's been going on, people have busy schedules. Um, you know, some people are, you know, they're not able to get to a gym. Uh, what would your recommendation be for, for home workouts or more importantly, you know, like my daughter sits here and, and does schoolwork at the table, homeschool. And what advice would you have for, for kids and uh, individuals who aren't able to get out? Yeah, good question. Um, So I would say another thing that we've actually been able to really push forward, we had been working on it for the past year and a half, but we actually, uh, due to COVID and the little extra time we had, uh, we got to work on it a little bit more as we created an app. And the app has daily mobility workouts. So like lower intensity. I'm just going to kind of go through these movements, these stretches, kind of check in with my body, make sure that like my hips feel good. My back feels good. My shoulders working like it should. Um, we have what we call daily durability workouts, which is more of like your higher intensity workout training. It would, you know, might have a med ball and a kettlebell and a band and, and body weight. Um, and then 
We also have in the app like desk mobility videos. If people are sitting at a desk all day long and they can just pop a video up every hour and at least like get a little bit of movement and kind of like twist and turn. And so they're not so stagnant. Um, and we have nutrition and lifestyle tips on the app. You know, we have a bunch of stuff on the app, um, but there are actually within the app as well a programs section and in there we have two different body weight programs. So there's a four week body weight program and a six week body weight program. So if people are at home and they really don't have any equipment whatsoever and they're not going to a gym, we have programs in there that I highly recommend following. Um, and I would just supplement that with, like I said earlier, trying to get outside. I know in the winter that's harder, especially with like more harsh weather, but if you can get outside and go for a walk, great. Um, otherwise, you know, like we've been talking about this whole time, just try to be mindful of food that you're eating and the sleep you're getting and just take care of yourself as best as you can, you know? So I got a couple of, uh, we started with some rapid fires. I got some rapid fires to, to kind of wrap things up first. Um, what does your average week look like working out? Do you have a rest day? Do you do two a days? What exactly does that look like? So currently I do four days of strength training and then usually take the other days off. Um, I have a pretty busy work schedule right now of just like actual like mobile clients that I'm going to see and clients that come to my house. And so I have like one day where it would be one of those days where I'd be trying to shove a workout in there. So I just take that as a rest day. I'm already up and moving a lot though. So I do get, you know, that uh, in. I do like to go swim on maybe my other two rest days, but I don't do crazy long swims. Um, I think the most I've ever done is 30 minutes, but I go to that pool, Barton Springs. I'll do about 15 to 20 minutes of just like slow swimming, again, focusing on nasal breathing, taking my time, um, and I'll take my dog for a long walk. So on my days that I'm not lifting right now, I'm either doing some sort of low intensity body weight training um, or just kind of taking it easy. I do do my mobility every single day, uh, regardless of if I'm training or not, so. Okay, and next question biggest struggle you've had to encounter throughout your journey and how'd you overcome it? Probably my mind, you know, I think, I think the biggest struggle, it's not necessarily one that sticks out at one certain time, but it's different times in my career and my life where I'm too fearful to do something or I'm too hard on myself. I'm um, yeah, lacking the confidence for something or just afraid of failure, right? Which I think a lot of us face and that would, I would say would hold me back, right? Um, I still till this day, like get very nervous sometimes. Like I used to not, I don't know, I'm very outgoing and I'm also very shy. And so there's certain times where like, I would rather kind of take a step back and there's times where I'm fine stepping up and being that leader and being that teacher. Um, but I can get really hard on myself prior to that situation, fearing that I'll mess up. And then I always walk away from it being like, oh, that was fine, right? And so I've had to practice over time that like, just put yourself out there, just do it and learn from that experience. Like I'll still survive, I'll be okay. Um, Biggest obstacle, yeah, is still till this day, like constantly trying to work on my mindset. Everybody's worst enemy. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, what is one thing that you really learned about yourself throughout your journey? I've learned that to that point, I'm, I'm more resilient um, than I thought. I actually am a great leader and um, I have a lot to offer, you know, and I think that's something that I've been pushing myself to step into and to own and um, yeah, accept, I guess. Okay. And then final question, and then um, we'll get all the information here for Durable Athlete. 50 years from now, Batista, I love to ask these people these questions. 50 years from now, what do you want people to say about Natalie Higby? I'll give you an example of what I want them to say. Uh, my training partner right now uh, texted me the other day after we worked out and she said, I don't know how woo woo you are, but in 2020, I've been trying to pay more attention to energy and how people make me feel. And she said, you're one of those people that every time I'm around you and every time I leave you, I feel like my cup is more full. And that is what I hope uh, 
when I'm 80 or as old as I am is that people always felt like their cup was more full after they spent time with me. I like that. That's a different answer than we always get from people. Okay. So thank you, ma'am, again, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, I feel pretty good that we got uh, the slot with you after the junior MBA. Um, (laughs) So if somebody wants to find out more about Durable Athlete, where can we point them to? Yeah. DurableAthlete.com is kind of the go-to. They can download the app from there. They can check out our blogs. They can look up other services that we offer through the website. I'm currently really trying to push more nutrition coaching for myself uh, because I know that's something that people need work on. And so they can find that through the website. And then I'm very active on Instagram. It's kind of like my main social media platform. And so it's now just my name, natalie.higby. Um, we do have a durable athlete Instagram and my partner, Christian, his name is Christian Placencia. Um, you can find him on Instagram as well. And that's like our, our main go-tos. We have a Facebook page and we have some other things, but I would say our website and Instagram are the best places to reach us and to find out more infor- information about what we do. Awesome. And we'll have all that information in the description of this podcast. Uh, Pearson, first one done. What final comments you got? Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, this was really awesome uh, for my my first co-host of the podcast. Definitely is making me hungry for more. Um, I felt like a kid. I'm just like jotting down. Like I said, I almost forgot that uh, I was <laughs> co-hosting because um, I was so so wrapped up in it. And uh, again, it's been a pleasure. Um, it's it's really nice to talk to somebody who uh, I feel I I can relate to a lot. And I think uh, Bodie and Batista can as well. I want to thank you for taking the time to, to having a chat with us. Uh, it's been it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Batista, what final comments you have? Oh, man. Uh, I think a lot of people could relate to you, Natalie, when it comes to fear, right? A lot of people can. But what's great about you is you don't let that restrict you, right? Um, you keep me- making steps forward, but what's really great about it, you is you are following your path, what you think it's supposed to be and doing what you love to do, right? A lot of people, they get in certain situations, like, I guess I'm going to do this the rest of my life instead of doing what makes them happy. Right. So not only that you adapt and overcame, especially when COVID hit, right. Capable with a way to reach people, even has to be a zoom, uh, just be careful. Make sure you have people's addresses in case they pass out. Right. And you have to call 911, but um, just keep moving forward uh, like you do. You have a really good energy and uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. And yeah, ma'am, thank you again for, for taking time to do this. I will continue to try to emulate your videos. Uh, hopefully I'll get a little bit stronger at that. But um, I think you're a huge inspiration for people out there. I- I'm glad we got connected with you. Um, definitely, we're going to plug all the amazing things you're doing. And once again, thank you for taking time to do this with us. I appreciate it. You guys are awesome. It was a pleasure and I'm honored to be here with you guys. Thank you for everything that all of you guys do. Um, thank you for service and just, yeah, for doing this podcast. Appreciate Thanks. it, ma'am. Absolutely. Well, folks, that is all the time we have for this episode. One more time, check us out on Facebook at The Shadows Podcast, also on Instagram, the underscore shadows underscore podcast. We are all out of time. Goodbye and good night.